do you find yourselves um, in a lecture theatre or a classroom attending a lesson in Astronomy 101 or Introductory Equilibrium Thermodynamics or whatever course of study you've elected to pursue? Um, who was it decided that um, that's how human knowledge should be subdivided and presented to you and uh, eventually applied by you once you've all assumed some sort of professional role and have become mechanical engineers or computer scientists or whatever? And the answer is that the application comes first. So at schools like these, we encounter knowledge um, in a nice, organized, theoretical structure in nice categories and silos of interrelated facts before we think about the, the purpose that we're going to put that knowledge to. Um, however, the, the way the, the knowledge is organized like that originally emerged as a result of the acquisition of useful knowledge while undertaking some sort of real-world application. So the application of a science precedes the codification of the useful knowledge that embodies into a subject, like the kind of subjects you can study here at the University of Strathclyde. So let's take as an example, not aeolics, but just to look historically at the pattern, thermodynamics. Um, this owes a lot to the, the application of thermodynamics during the development of the tools and techniques that are associated with industrialization. Here's a Bolton and Watt steam engine. This is a foundational tool for the emergent industrial revolution. About half a mile from here in 1765, James Watt was uh, taking a walk on Glasgow Green when it, the idea of having a separate condenser for a steam engine occurred to him. And uh, that radically enhanced the efficiency of steam engines, which allowed them to make a crucial contribution to the then emerging industrial revolution. And this, in turn, stimulated the investigations that we know of as thermodynamics to understand how um, engines like this work. It wasn't for nearly a century before that science was actually formally defined in 1854 by Lord Kelvin as the, um, the relation, the subject of the relation between heat and the forces between contiguous parts of bodies. And the first textbook wasn't written until 1859. Uh, by William Rankin uh, across town at that other place, the University of Glasgow. The subject today, of course, is not where have we been, but where are we going? So what we need to do today is look at what disciplines are emerging now in response to the needs we have today. What investigations and measurements and analysis are we undertaking now that could be stimulating the development of a subject? And one area that immediately seems obvious to me is, is wind power. Where steam engines were historically the, um, uh, the, the engine of change um, in, during the Industrial Revolution, wind turbines are the engines of our, our new sunrise industries. We have new high-tech companies um, putting in place power purchase agreements with green energy companies or investing directly in the construction of wind farms as they try and be responsible consumers of electricity. And this chart shows the growth in the contribution renewable energy makes to global energy production, and, and that is projected by the International Energy Agency. And we see that it's projected to become, to exceed a quarter by 2018. And wind power makes a significant contribution to that. Uh, we see that wind will be the main contribution, overtaking hydro, um, by 2020. But in many important respects, wind power is not like other kinds of energy generation, it's unique. We can't adopt the, the same approaches that we've used in relation to other forms of generation when it comes to wind. We need new tools and new techniques. So why is this? Well, we can consider three categories of generation. In the first, we're consuming a relatively simple resource, say some kind of fuel that we burn, and the technology required to exploit it is also relatively simple, so the challenges involved are relatively simple. Um, in contrast, we could have a mode of generation where the technology is complex, like a nuclear power station, and so the challenges themselves then are relatively complex. Now, historically, the assumption was always that um, wind power was relatively simple. A wind turbine is a relatively simple object compared to a nuclear power station. However, it's now clear to us now, we now appreciate that wind, is, wind belongs to a third category where uh, in fact, the resource is highly complex, and that's really the gnarly bit where all the interesting stuff is. The wind is uncontrolled. It's 
not regulated. The resource in these other two categories above it are regulated and controlled. With wind, we're not exposing our assets to a well-regulated um, resource that's being consumed at a constant rate. We're in, in, under highly controlled conditions. We're exposing it to an uncontrolled, highly variable, highly intermittent resource um, that's exposing our wind turbines to an energy flux that or varies over three or four orders of magnitude. The wind is always trying to break your wind turbine. So why bother? Well, the wind is a renewable resource. It has no fuel costs. So when we go back and we look at what we're doing with these other modes of generation, when we can consider these modes of generation that rely on purchasing a fuel that can be consumed in a controlled, well-regulated fashion, we see that, in a sense, what we're not really purchasing is fuel. We're purchasing simplicity. Um, because, or rather the illusion of simplicity, because we're deferring the, the complexities associated with the environmental impacts to, to later on. For example, with a nuclear power station to the end of the project life cycle when we have to decommission it, or with other forms of generation um, beyond that to when we all have to deal with the consequences of climate change. Wind power requires us to confront complexity head on right now. But when we look at anthropogenic climate change, um, we can see that that's perhaps more realistic because uh, it's later than you think. Later is now when we, we realise what we have to contend with there. If we cannot control the wind, there's an urgent need to, to understand it with precision and detail so that we can design wind turbines that can withstand the loads that are imposed on them so that we can operate them as efficiently and as reliably as possible um, and uh, so that we can... Uh, predict as accurately as possible the energy that will be generated. So we undertake various investigations and analyses and measurements to achieve this. And these are all examples of applied science. So the question that arises is, do we see a science of the wind emerging from this application? Do we see the emergence of the Olex? Now, I like to think one place to look for clues when you're trying to answer that question is to look at the measurements that are required to undertake those investigations because after all there is no science without measurement just as the favored instrument of the astronomer is the telescope the favored instrument of the eolicist is the lidar where the astronomer infers the velocities associated with the expansion of the universe by making observations of distant stars and galaxies with a telescope an eolicist infers what the wind velocity is by making observations of microscopic particles of dust in the lower atmosphere that are entrained with the wind. But whereas the objects that the astronomer is observing shine with their own light, the aeolicist has to illuminate the aerosols in order to observe them. So to do this, we use lasers. And the, the equipment that delivers these laser emissions for that is a LiDAR. So here's a wind turbine. And uh, we have installed lidars on it so that we can investigate how the wind behaves as it encounters and interacts with it. These effectively let us see the wind. So um, this is very useful when it comes to answering key questions like how efficiently does it extract energy from the wind? How much energy does it leave in the wind for the next turbine along? Um, how do the varying wind conditions affect the turbine? Here's a plan view acquired by one of those lidars of the wakes in the wind farm. And there's the side elevation of the same thing. And it's a good example of the kinds of investigation that we're undertaking just now in the, in the wind power industry. Um, when we look at these measurements, um, we can look at how the wind speed varies with height as you move further and further into the array um, at these locations as the wind moves from left to right across that. Um, so uh, there is the, the wind profile in front of the first turbine, and that's the wind profile behind it influenced by the extraction of wind uh, energy by the turbine. There's the profile behind the second turbine. And as we look at this, we see the emergence, the development of this energy gap. Um, this is, suggests itself to us that this is where energy is being taken from above the wind turbine to allow the flow within the wind turbine to recover from the extraction of energy from it as, as the wind moves through the, 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 turbine, uh, the area of turbines. So what's happening is, as the the wind encounters the wind farm, more and more energy is extracted from above it, um, and the wind farm is modifying the wind conditions around it. A key thing when we look at this 
is to remember that these are measurements. It looks like a computer simulation, but it is in fact a measurement. The image represents a measurement. And in a sense, this is the point. Because when we're looking at simulations, what we're doing is we're representing the physics and the theory um, and the extent of our understanding in terms of equations that can be solved numerically within a computer. And these computer models can incorporate our understandings of mass and momentum, um, gravity, of buoyancy effects and how they, they, they influence wind conditions, such as the possibility of recovery by energy being pulled down from above. Um, they look at how energy is transferred from the, the scale of large turbulent structures down to heat at the molecular level and lots of other considerations. Uh, these equations represent our understanding and we solve them numerically using computer simulations to provide us with predictions. What the LiDAR measurements provide us with are observations whose level of detail and precision for the first time matches the level of sophistication of our predictions. And this allows us to select between accurate and inaccurate predictions more effectively than ever before. When theory and measurement come together in this way, the, the product is science. In this instance, the science of the wind, Aeolix. So just as we saw in the case of thermodynamics, Aeolix is emerging just now as a result of its application as the wind industry tries to understand the wind and how best to exploit it. And we've seen how the distinctions we make between different sciences are artificial. They don't reflect an underlying intrinsic structure to the knowledge. They arise from the use we make of the knowledge that they embody. And at a deeper level, all sciences are interconnected. And these sciences emerge from highly interdisciplinary collaborative work early on in the, in the life of an industry like this. The interconnectedness also finds another rather immediate and compelling manifestation at a local level in an urgent time scale. Recently, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change has issued reports that are warning in the starkest terms yet about the hazard posed to our society by anthropogenic climate change. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the highest it's been for 800,000 years. We're confronted with a significant rise in global temperatures that can only be limited by an immediate expansion of renewable energy generation that consumes no fuel and emits no carbon dioxide as a result. Where the development of thermodynamics was stimulated by the needs arising from the narrow imperatives of nascent industrial capitalism as it accelerated the rate at which we consume resources and short-circuited the carbon cycle, the emergence of Aeolix is stimulated by a wholly more comprehensive set of needs that have arisen as a consequence. The needs we must now respond to transcend short-term commercial interests or class interests or national interests or even the interests of our species. The needs of the planet are now paramount. Industrialization has catapulted us into a situation where we exceed the carrying capacity of our environment and we can no longer recklessly and unsustainably exploit it. And indeed, recent mathematical models have suggested that in order to avert disaster, we need to restore the sustainability of our environmental impacts and reduce the economic inequalities of our societies. If we want to continue, we have to become responsible stewards of the planet we share with each other and temper the trespass we inflict on its habitats. And in this, eolicists, which is the physicists, the engineers, the scientists, all engaged in making wind power a success, and the investors, and the policy makers, and you, the consumers, have an important role to play. A science exists because it's needed, and now we need eolics. Thank you.